captivate our gaze. Oh, you captivate our hearts and minds. Oh, come now, God. Come now, God. Oh, the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. Buried 
they came to mourn the stone was rolled away the veil was torn for he had risen he is the king of all the earth in 
Thank you, Amick. Take your Bible tonight and go to the 73rd Psalm. 73rd Psalm. And we'll look there together for a few moments tonight. Psalm 73. Tonight, uh, the question that uh, is posed and put forth is why do the righteous suffer? I've had several questions come in uh, asking why. Uh, and some of them enumerated <clears throat> an issue. If children were doing right, we live for God, and yet this happens. I know this person, and uh, they live for God. They're, they're good people. They're righteous people. They don't just play church. And, and then something tragic comes in their life. Why do the righteous suffer? Some people ask the question this way. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's a very poor question. Uh, there's, well, they're not any good people. All right? Our righteousness like filthy rags. But I understand the question. If, if God loves us and he's good, and if we obey him, why do good things not come? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do not. The greatest illustration of that in all the scripture, of course, is Job. Job was a righteous man, the Bible said, and yet God gave him for testing. Gave the devil, said, here's open book. You can do anything but kill him. Boy, he gave him a rough road for many chapters. His friends turned against him. Tough things came. Well, the psalmist says the same in Psalm 73. Just read the first three verses and then make a comment or two and talk about suffering tonight and why the righteous suffer. The Bible says in Psalm 73, Surely... God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So, so surely God's good to Israel, and if you're pure of heart, God's good to you. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. See, the flip side of the question is this. Not just why do the good suffer, but why are the wicked blessed? Why are these people that, it goes on in verse 4, says they don't have any pain, and when they die, their body's fat. It means by that, they're not starving. They're not in trouble as others, nor are they plagued like mankind. They wear pride as a necklace, the garment of violence. These are mean people. And, and yet, we see them blessed. You skip down to verse 15. He said, if I had said I would speak thus, behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Go to verse 28, the end of the chapter. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. Underline that. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Here's the goodness. 
The goodness is not ours. The goodness is God's. And when the good of God comes to you, whether you are suffering or whether you are blessed, you are then on the right path when you see that the goodness of God is where you glory. I was just a, a lad, a teenage boy, when my Sunday school teacher got cancer. And I sure didn't understand. This was the best woman I knew. She was so good to us. She was the place that gave us a house for our Cub Scout troop to meet. She gave us gifts, and she got the cancer. She suffered for years. I was 15 years old. I was boyfriend and girlfriend with her neighbor. And I was at their house on a Saturday night and the call came that she had died. We all piled in the car and we went just a short distance down the road and pulled up the long driveway to the Gantz house. Her husband was a very wealthy man. They had a lot of acres of ground he had a huge business. They helped build the church. He brought jobs to our little city. And yet she got the cancer. Now, I'll never forget it. I stood in the living room for the first time. And they rolled that gurney. And it had a deal that looked like a bed spread over it. I'd never seen anybody dead be rolled out before. I've done that scores of times now, of course. Nobody said a word. A few tears. But they rolled her out. and I don't know why. I guess I just, I thought it was pretty cool. They didn't even have to pick it up, they just ran it up to the back of the hearse and they opened the door and, and as they bumped it, the, the wheel deals on the bottom just fold up on it and it just slides right. Just like an easy bake oven, it just it goes right in there. Now that capture, I'd never seen that before. But I remember in my mind, I, was, I, I wasn't... Strong enough to say it out loud, but I was thinking in my heart, Lord, I sure know some other people that you should have given that cancer to. We needed this lady. Why did she get it? That, and Lord, there's so many old wicked people. If we could just get rid of three or four of them, we'd be better off. I'm just saying what we sometimes think that we don't verbalize. But the psalmist verbalized it. Verse 3, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Dr. Adrian Rogers, one of the most oft-quoted preachers in America, now that he's dead and gone, that was one of Adrian's favorite verses. He's done it to me. If he saw you and you were dressed fine, he'd walk up and he'd rub your clothes with his fingers like it was... Fine material. He say, oh, I'm always amazed at the prosperity of the wicked. <laughs> he's done it to me. You have on a nice tie, and he'd rub it, you know, and you'd think he's going to brag on you. And he'd say, oh, my, I'm always amazed at the prosperity of the wicked. I'm amazed at the prosperity of the wicked sometimes. How in the world somebody just lives a godless life, makes all that money and just seems like they never get sick and they're going forward and everything just, you know, they got the Midas touch. Everything they touch turns to gold. 
And I see some good and what I think are godly people. Seems like they're just slugging away and they can't get ahead for anything. And I'll see those tragedies come, like in Job. You could name them tonight. You know that young mother gets breast cancer. Why did that happen? That young boy has a diving accident. Why did that happen? Johnny Erickson. Why do the righteous suffer? Well, I want to give you seven reasons that suffering is a blessing. You're not going to answer the question. Many of these why questions will be what Dr. Crispell used to call the unponderables of life. <laughs> you, you can think you know, but there's no easy answer. They're the imponderables. You can ponder, but you just can't get there. What do we learn out of suffering? No matter if it's physical or mental or emotional, or those things that just rip your heart. Yeah, I, 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 I preached my heart out this morning. Matter of fact, I preached my voice out this morning. I've been having a little drainage head colds. So I'm just having a few issues there tonight. On the way home, we got, just checked my phone, I pulled in. Man, I had so many good emails. Boy, I had one. They called me a heretic. They told me I was judgmental. They told me I was full of pride. Matter of fact, they gave me homework and said, you ought to do this to confess your sin. That just really built me up. You know, people can be wicked with their tongue or email. Most times you're paying attention, you get a little tired and sometimes it'll just kind of beat on you. You just think, man, I... You ever get it? Yeah? You get thinking, poor people, you know, Lord, if everybody's as great a preacher as I was, they wouldn't get trouble like that. Hey, we all suffer, is what I'm telling you, in varied ways, physical, mental, emotional, relational. So what do we learn from suffering? We will suffer. So what do we learn from that? Well, let's look. Let me give you seven things to learn from suffering tonight. And when it comes, learn. Number one, when we suffer, it helps us to become partakers of holiness. It, it leads us to be partakers of holiness. Look at Hebrews 12, verses 6 and 10. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges. 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 I wonder if he does that with a switch. If you use a switch, you get in trouble in our culture today. <laughs> the Lord scourges every what? Son that he receives. And he loves. Let's skip down to verse 10. For they disciplined us for a short time to seem best to them, but God disciplines us for our good so that we may share his what? Holy. Suffering, if you respond correctly, will lead you to partake in the holiness of the Lord God. It'll lead you to be to righteous, holy, live. You'll trust yourself, you'll trust him, and there'll come a holiness in your life. Number two, to move us to righteousness. Not only does it give us holiness, but it leads us to right to do right. In Hebrews 12 and verse number 11, the Bible says, all discipline for the moment 
seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Can I get a witness? <laughs> you ever been disciplined on your job? Doesn't that just bless you? We're watching you. See, discipline doesn't seem to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those that have been trained by discipline, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Suffering, this disciplining of the Lord, when we respond properly, it leads to righteousness right kind of living and the righteousness of Christ in us. Number three, suffering is there to make us instruments of comfort, of comfort. Second Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. The Bible said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction. There it is so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Let me tell you, God never wastes a hurt. And when you suffer, just give time, enough time, and you're gonna run into somebody that needs what you've learned if you learned out of your hurt what God wanted to teach you. And then you become the teacher. While we were in seminary, we lived on Baldwin Avenue. We had a Hispanic gentleman we rented a little house from. I came in one day and my wife said to me, we're gonna have a baby. We were excited. Amen. A few weeks later, I came home from class and she was sitting on the edge of the bed crying. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I lost the baby. So I didn't know what to do. I just hugged her best I knew. That happened again to us later. Lost the second child. Liz had had to have surgery before we got married and have an ovary removed, and we didn't know if we would ever really be able to have kids. But finally we did. And then we did again. And now young mamas will come, want to be mom, and say, I don't know if we can or we can't. I'll send them to my wife. She'll take them straight to the book of Ecclesiastes. She's got that verse circle where God taught her about how God forms and knows the bones in the womb. And he watches over every moment of the formation of that child. I can't help those ladies, but I'm telling you, my wife can help those ladies. Why? Because she responded to her suffering and her hurt and learn the comfort of God and the way God comforted her, then she is able to comfort others. Back in 1993 and four, we had a little ruckus in the church and then 97 came and it was a hard year for me at Olive and it was difficult. We had a tough season, hard patch. And I learned some things through that. Now when young preachers come and they say, man, I, I'm hurting and some people are against me and I don't know what to do, I can put my arm around them and say, let me tell you what God taught me. Let me show you what God's trying to teach you. So all he's trying to do is do what he did to me in 1997. He's trying to beat everything out of you that's not Jesus. They look at me with big, I'm just saying, but I'm just telling you, he's trying to get your attention. I'm not telling you people are right or you're right or they're wrong or you're wrong. I'm just telling you, here's what God's up to. And the way he comforted me, he'll comfort you. 
I've never lost a parent. Both my parents are alive, but I watch many of you, especially the widows, the almost 300 widows that are in our church. It's hard for me to stand with somebody and they've lost their spouse. But I can point them, especially the ladies when that guy's died, to come alongside of them and that lady will step in and man, she can speak volumes. She knows how to respond to that text when it says the silence is deafening. Mm -hmm. She's learned to let God be her good. And when she learns through that suffering, she's able to give. I'm telling you, friend, God never wastes a hurt. When he teaches you, you'll teach others. Partakers of holiness moves us to righteousness, makes us instruments of comfort. Number four, suffering comes that we may know him, that we may know him. Look in Philippians 3, Philippians 3 and verse number 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his what? Sufferings, being conformed to his death. Well, if Jesus suffered, are we better than our Lord? No. We learn from him and we know him in our suffering in a way we've never known him before. We meet him at that point of hurt and the only way we know to look is up and say, oh God, be merciful unto me. Number five, to be glorified with him. Suffering will lead you to be glorified with him. Romans 8 and verse 17, listen to what the Bible says. And if we are children, we are heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be what? Glorified. If we suffer with him, we'll also be glorified with him. Now I want to ask a non-rhetorical question I'd like somebody to answer. When is it okay for you to be glorified? Now don't say never because that verse just said you're going to be glorified. So when can you be glorified? When glory goes back to him. You reflect it to him. That is the only answer. You, you are a reflection. And, and when people bring glory to you, you, you reflect it to him. And so when glory comes your way, and it does, when you do good things, then glory will come. People say, way to go, John. Amen. Well done. But you can't receive that glory. Now, now don't give false humility. Well, you know, God just uses the humble. Something's crossways there. I'm grateful that God would choose to use me. All glory belongs to him. And in suffering, in suffering, I'm telling you, you can radiate glory back to God. When, when you stand, when it looks like you ought to fall, God's given you power. Then glory to God comes through your life. Number six, not only to be glorified with him, but to reign with him. Oh, yeah. 2 Timothy 2, 12. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. He's all in this passage talking about uh, suffering and standing in it. And if you endure, if you walk through, you reign with him. You reign with him. And then number seven, number seven, suffering teaches us to look forward to heaven. Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory 
that's to be revealed to us. When we suffer here, we, we get ready for the other side. So now I want us to have a little testimony meeting for just a minute. Who are you looking forward to seeing in glory? Anybody over here? Your brother, how old was he? All right. A brother that's there. Your dad. How old was your dad when he died? 55. 55. Way too early. In our economy, not God's. Amen. Charles? Your son. Yeah, man, I remember that night. That was a hard night. Do what? Glory came that night. He sure did. We got in the floor and cried out to God. Glory came. There's no way you get through that. Amen. Anybody else? Remind her, your husband. Oh, I thought, you, that's right, it's, that, that's correct. You're two brother, that's right. Excuse me. Mom and dad. 54. Wow. How'd he die? Mm. But he knew the Lord. A preacher. Wow. Son and a grandson. I remember some of those days walking there with you. Mom and older brother. Amen. Yeah. Somebody over here? See, the Lord's going to be there. Amen. Looking forward to meeting him. Amen. Yes, sir. My mother-in-law had two husbands. They're both there. How old was your granddaughter? Stillborn. All right. You know, I've often wondered, those two kids that uh, we lost, I, I don't know what that looks like when you get on the other side. We didn't give them a name. Just, but there, if life begins at conception, then there's life there. So I'm... I'm curious at best what that would be like. Glad I didn't have to pay the tuition on all of that. But, uh, but I'll never forget to hurt. And it makes heaven a little sweeter. I got grandparents there, friends there. Uh, Eddie Shari is my good friend. I look forward to seeing Eddie there on the other side. Be a good day, good reunion. Talk about the things of God. I just think back to Ollie family in my 24 years being your pastor and the people we've buried. That, I mean, so many of them, but many, you know, that you walk closer with than others. Bob Davis and his wife Betty. Love brother Bob, he helped me. See, what I'm telling you, friends, suffering gets you ready for that because when you go over there, there's none of that. There is no suffering, and it makes you long for heaven. So to cut to the chase on this question, you're going to suffer. Get ready. In this world, we suffer. Some more than others, some deeper, some darker, some tougher. But sorrow and suffering comes to all. And if we respond properly, how do we respond? Well, it's back in Psalm 73 where, where he says that I, I come to, to that last verse in verse 28. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. It's when you draw close, that's where the good comes. I, I remember that I was a preacher and 
Dallas, Texas. And he used to make this statement, and I've argued with him about it. You should thank God for anything that makes you pray more than you pray now. I said, I don't want that. Because what makes me pray more than I pray now is bad stuff most of the time. He said, until you thank God for that that causes you to pray, you'll never get to that verse where it's the nearness of God becomes the good for you. So in the suffering, let others help you, but let the goodness of God be your strength. In the suffering, when we walk through it.